so excited that you have joined us today. And we'd like to offer to you that um, it's gonna have a lovely conversation and following, we'll talk for about 30 minutes between Serene and Liz. And following that conversation, um, we'll have a chance for Q&A. We'll spend about 15 minutes doing that. So I really highly encourage you to start those questions as soon as you hear them beginning the conversation. We'll try to make sure we get to everyone. But so without further ado, it's just my job now just to introduce um, Serene's guest for today. Uh, Serene, of course, is the Serene Jones, Dr. Serene Jones, is the president of Union Theological Seminary. And we're always thrilled to have her host this event um, that we've been doing all summer. Um, so again, thank you, those of you who are returning, thank you for coming back. And those of you who are here for the first time, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope you do attend again. Um, so today we have Dr. Liz Theo Harris um, as Serene's guest. And um, she has been, uh, she is a union grad. Uh, she did her MDiv with us in 2004. Um, but besides that, she is currently the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights and Social Justice. And she's also co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, along with Reverend Dr. William Barbara. Um, they've organized the largest coordinated wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in the 21st century, and has since emerged as one of the leading, as one of the nation's leading social movement forces. And I can tell you firsthand, she is a force to be reckoned with. So I am really looking excited, um, looking forward to this conversation today. Um, and we're so glad that you're here, here Liz, and joined us. And Serene, um, please, I'll, I'll turn this over to you now. Thank you all. Oh, thank, you. thank you, Rita. And um, welcome everyone who's joined us today for Knowledge and Nourishment. It's great to be on with Liz. Um, I know that many of you watching, your hearts are very heavy today. Um, as we heard yesterday about the um, absence of accountability in the officers uh, who killed Breonna Taylor in Louisville. And so I thought it'd be good if we could just together have a moment of silence in recognition of this grave injustice and of this precious life that was lost and so many lives that have been lost. So will you join me just for a minute of silence? So thank you. Um, so here we are today um, to have yet another uh, important conversation um, about the work of Union Theological Seminary and about the work of social justice um, in, at Union in New York City, in the nation and globally. Um, I am very pleased that our semester has um, gotten off to a good start with a, a September intensive um, where students are enrolled and learning remotely. Um, we're going to be remote this fall. Um, we have a, a healthy sized entering class. Um, students who are, are coming out even in the midst of this pandemic, uh, very committed to the kind of education that Union offers and um, we couldn't be more um, involved and engaged and convinced of the importance of the kind of education that happens here now than we are at this moment in our nation's history, um, which seems to be uh, uh, a moment filled with storms and um, conflicts um, and conflicts that have very high stakes. Um, so there's no one better to bring into that conversation and to be with us here today than Liz Theo Harris. So happy to have her. I have um, been at Union for 13 years and have known Liz those whole 13 years. I've um, been at her graduation, um, which was with her most recent degree, her PhD. I was at her ordination 
uh, when she earned that little collar she's wearing. Um, I was at with her last year when she received Union's highest award for an alumni, the UNITAS award, um, and have also uh, been a part of the conversations that have seen the um, evolution of the work that began as the poverty initiative at Union. Um, a critical part of the education of Union is the presence of the poverty initiative, um, which is now um, um, called by the name of Kairos and is also very deeply committed to the Poor People's Campaign as we see in Liz's own work. Um, I forgot to add, I've also been around to see uh, new life uh, in the Liz Theo Harris family come into the world. So it's like, it's all those big moments um, that I've had the delight to be present to. Um, but Liz, I think it would be very helpful um, if you could start off by telling us sort of how the Poverty Initiative came to be and then what it meant when the Poverty Initiative migrated into uh, the name of the Cairo Center um, and how that is connected to the Poor People's Campaign. Because um, I know it's all very clear in your head, um, but I think for many people, those uh, the differences and similarities and intersections aren't so clear. So could you, could you start us off there? Of course, and thanks so much, Serene, and to everyone at Union Theological Seminary for, for being um, the, the center, the convening power for social justice and theological education that this country and this world needs um, right now. Um, and for the ongoing, you know, uh, joint collaboration that we have uh, in, in doing that justice work in the world. So, so I do think that the the, that these connections and these histories, um, you know, have a lot to say about where we are now. Um, you know, I started at Union Theological Seminary in 2001, um, being introduced to Union both because of its history, but also because of Union standing with poor and homeless and dispossessed people uh, over and over and over again. And so I was actually first in the halls of Union in James Chapel, um, with a multiracial, multilingual, multinational group of people and who said, what, what should the religious response to the evils of society, of racism, of poverty be, you know, in this, in this age? And so some students and some faculty got together um, in the early 2000s and started small and said, what would it look like for a seminary to, to put poor people, organize poor people, the issues of racism and poverty at the center of all of its life, um, of its community life, of its intellectual life, of its bridge to the, to the, the larger world. Um, and so we formed what was called the Poverty Initiative um, after doing actually a survey of seminaries across the country and seeing what people were doing and teaching and learning and exchanging on these you know, life and death issues and, and found that, that of the 30 seminaries that we, we, we looked at, nobody was doing anything systemic. And we said, well, this is, this is union then, this is where union has to be. And so we formed the Poverty Initiative and we were a, a small program, we were feisty. Um, we had students and faculty and staff and administration and board members involved. Um, and, and we grew and we grew. And then in 2013, about 10 years after um, the formation of the Poverty Initiative, we said, we need to expand, we need to grow, we need to multiply, um, and we need a Poor People's Campaign for today. And so we formed the Kairos Center. Um, Kairos is a Greek word, right? That means the breaking down of the old, the the birth of a new movement coming through. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a biblically based idea. Um, and we said, we're living in a Kairos moment. Um, and so we need to kind of be up to the task. And so we, we launched the Kairos Center. We kept the poverty initiative going and, and has a program basically of, of the Kairos Center. And then now since 2013, the Kairos Center and the poverty initiative together as the Cairo Center have been building and organizing, looking at the, the concepts of social justice, of, of human rights and, and where our world's religions stand 
on building a movement for, for change, for justice, for truth, for love, for equality today. Um, when we launched the Cairo Center with a launch event, a symposium that, that you helped to, to host, um, Serene, you know, uh, we, we put out this charge that we were, we were approaching in five years, the 50th anniversary of the, of the Poor People's Campaign, the Dr. King and the Welfare Rights Movement and, and Indigenous people and, and Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers all had been a part of. Um, and we said, the only way you can actually honor uh, work like Dr. King, like a Poor People's Campaign, isn't just to praise it, isn't just to acknowledge it, but it's to commit to, to building it for our, our world today. So when we launched the Cairo Center, we said, one of our main objectives was gonna be building and relaunching, reigniting a poor people's campaign for, for these times, for these conditions. And, and so then in 2000, of the original launch of the poor people's campaign, the Cairo Center led and directed by myself and repairs of the breach, uh, uh, the president of whom is Re Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, um, put forward uh, a new Poor People's Campaign called the Poor People's Campaign, a National Call for Moral Revival. From, since that time, we've been continuing to organize and grow. The Poor People's Campaign is organized in 45 states across the country. There are coordinating committees made up of low-income leaders, of uh, faith leaders, of moral clergy, of activists, of advocates who wake up every day thinking about how are we going to build a movement, um, a movement that can take on systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, militarism in the war economy, and this false moral narrative of religious and in many cases Christian nationalism. So the Cairo Center still helps to anchor that campaign. Um, you know, since the launch of the Poor People's Campaign in the spring of 2018 with the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in the 21st century, the campaign has continued to grow. Um, this past June, we held a mass Poor People's Assembly and a moral march on Washington and, and more than 3 million people joined on Facebook alone. Uh, it was the largest digital gathering of poor and low-income people um, in the United States. And there were folks from all over the world. And, and the work has continued. And so, uh, so, so that's, that's, where, that's where we are. Yeah, so friends, I think we may have lost the range. She may have had a signal problem. But Liz, if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask a question here because it was so, and we'll, I'm sure Serena is coming back on. Um, it was so, it's so powerful what you're doing and this work. But in these times, I mean, we started today and Serene so eloquently started us off with a moment of silence because of this level of injustice. So how do you stay hopeful? I mean, it's, when you named all of the things that y'all are doing, how does one stay hopeful in this moment? I mean, these are very dangerous, very difficult days. Before this pandemic hit, there were 140 million people who were poor or one fire, mm -hmm. one health crisis, one job loss, one way less important emergency away from mm -hmm. deep poverty. In this, the richest nation in the history of the world. There are thousands of people who are killed every year from police violence. And systemic racism is alive and well in these yet to be United States. We see this in the lack of any accountability in the case of Breonna Taylor. We see this in the fact that 26 states have passed racist voter suppression laws since 2013. We see this in the mass incarceration, the mass detention and deportation systems. We see this in the mistreatment of indigenous and native peoples. And, and, it, and it's, it's, a, it's a lot. And then you have a healthcare crisis that happens 
when there were already 80 some million people that had inadequate health care. And now tens of millions more have lost their employer based health care. And the healthcare companies are making huge profits off of, of death. We reached more than 200,000 people who have died from COVID. And we've heard that many of those deaths were unnecessary. Um, that it's just because our leaders have failed us, right? So it's, and then you have the world literally on fire. I mean, you have the worst wildfires, you have terrible hurricanes, you have you know, just cr climate crisis after climate crisis, not just in the United States, but all across the world, right? And, and it's, it's so much. Um, but folk have been dealing with this level of injustice mm. for a long time. And so you can't stare away from it. Mm -hmm. You can't ignore it. You can't just say, okay, but let's just get back to normal. Normal wasn't working. Normal was police violence. Normal was poverty. And, and I think the, 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 for, for me, how I stay hopeful is that I mourn right through all of that loss, mm -hmm. but then commit to continuing to organize. Because what we see across the country is that there are in 13 states next week, Medicaid marches happening of uninsured and underinsured folks who have nothing to lose but their poverty and lack of health care, right? You have massive eviction resistance happening um, of untold scale. You have low wage workers coming together that have never come together before. You have people in Kentucky from what they call the hood to the holler mm -hmm. organizing together. You know, we, this past week, the Poor People's Campaign had caravans in, in seven different parts of Kentucky and in Washington, DC. 150,000 people online or in person joined just to call out to account Mitch McConnell and the misery that he's creating um, with trying to stack the court, with suppressing the vote, with sabotaging the postal service, with, with kicking people off of healthcare, all of this, right? People are actually rising up. But what we've seen over the summer is a beautiful, painful, but beautiful racial and economic justice movement um, that actually is growing and, and in gaining power. And so, so, you know, I don't look into the face of this level of suffering and try to turn away. Mm. So look mm. into it. And you have to say that this doesn't have to be. I, my first day of systematic theology class at Union Theological Seminary was in James Cone's class. And, and we sat there and we didn't know what was happening. It was 9-11 and the Twin Towers came falling down. And we had to have a whole conversation in systematic theology about what is faith? Is faith that good things are gonna to continue to happen to me because good things have happened to me in the past? Or is faith that even though only darkness, only difficulty, only violence have been in my reality, I think something else is possible. And I think God is calling us to that. And I think that's, that's the kind of faith and that's the kind of hope. It's not an idealism, it isn't, let's just, say things aren't so bad because they are really bad for a lot of people and they're getting worse for many more and and this chasm is growing and so you have to you have to deal with that and then from there you can rebuild right and that's it's, always what happens what I hear you saying is we have to put on a big human pants you know <laughs> underpants and just sort of you know just gird ourselves for this and I think you said something that's you know, I've only been at Union for a year, but I see again and again in our students and in our alumni that this sense of justice, that is uh, many times sort of, if it, even if it wasn't born at Union, it may have come from your family and otherwise, but it is really, um, the skills are really honed at Union. And I see our students doing this. And you, so you spoke a little bit to it that what gave you this real sense of not just justice, 
but justice in action and not just passion, but passion and compassion in action. And what gave you the courage to say that here I am a small class, like you said, you know, here we've searched, you know, 30 seminaries, no one is doing this. So we said, okay, we're gonna be early adopters. We're going to just forge ahead without a roadmap. And here we are today with the largest mass movement to enable poor people and then a campaign to do something new and different in the history of the US, right? I don't think I'm overstating that. And then what is it about this, about our union students that can do that? No, and I mean, I think union is, is so important in all of this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I get to travel around the country. Um, well, I did before the last oh, this, right? but for years and years and years, right? Connecting up with many of the, the, the most powerful movements and actions and protests and educationals of, of, that are happening, right? And if people of faith or people of conscience are involved, there is a union alum or two or 10 or 20 in there, right? right? I, 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 that, that, that's, that, that network of powerful prophetic leaders mm -hmm. who are putting their faith in action, putting their passion in action mm -hmm. and, and, and connecting up across all of these lines, you know, connecting the issues, you know, connecting the dots, that that, you know, folks, I think, are taught how to do that at Union. And then when you graduate from Union, you graduate into an alumni network of, of people that are doing that, not as a, a job, not as something that they do for one day or one year. It's a lifetime, right? I mean, so Rosa Parks talks about her lifetime of being rebellious, right? Well, Union is a, a network of alums mm -hmm. who have who are committing a lifetime to rebellious social justice and action. And, and, and I'm very proud to be one of those people, um, one of many people that are every day waking up saying, what does re God require of us in this moment? You know, or, or, or answering the call, who will stand in the gap? Or saying, okay, um, woe to you who oppress the poor and rob homeless children of their rights. Like these are our sacred texts that we learn at Union that we then are, don't just learn by memorizing, but by being called to answer the problems and help heal the, the issues in the world. And, and, and that is happening on a regular basis all across this country, all across this world by union alums and leaders. And, and that is deeply inspiring. Right, yeah, and hopeful, yeah. So, so hopeful. welcome back. I know you had a little bit of a technical issue there. My, my connection, um, my power, my whole house went out completely. Okay. So, but then it came back, so I'm back. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly, that. right. And I will turn this back over to you. We were just- I don't, I don't know if you got to ask the question and if you did, then I'll go on to another question. But I wanna, I, if uh, Liz could talk about, you know, what was it in her life that like, how did you get to where you are in terms of, you know, most of it, it goes back to, to something that happens in us early and we, mm -hmm. you know, get directed where we're going, so. Can you tell us just a little of the story of your journey to Union? Yeah, I mean, so I was raised in a, a family that was deeply dedicated to doing justice. Um, uh, my mom was a activist first and foremost. Um, yeah. And my mom, you know, passed away this summer. And, and I think about all of the lessons I learned from, from her about how, charity is not enough, that we need justice, how you have to keep on going back and going back and doing things when they're hard or when they're easy or when they work or when they don't work and you still have to keep on doing them. And I was also raised in a family that, that said that you have to link you know, your mind and your soul and your heart, right? That like, that you have to, you have to you know, strive to understand the problems of the world and then commit yourself 
to, to bringing everything you have, right? So I was, you know, going to protests and church meetings, you know, as a toddler. Um, I was, you know, organized. I was a deacon in my church, you know, by the time I was 16. I was, um, I mean, it all was connected to my faith. Um, but that faith was always about, you know, a, a, a faith in the public square. Um, and so then I came to Union because again, where was there a place um, where there were, there were people of faith out there and people of different faiths, faiths that were similar to mine and faiths that were different than mine, but people who were motivated by a strong sense of, of value and commitment from our world's religious traditions, um, but who also saw that that faith wasn't just about a personal relationship between you and just Jesus, um, uh, but, but about you and your neighbor, you and the world and, and the role that you can play in that world. And so again, I, I, my first days at Union before I had even decided to go to seminary, I, I was you know studying social change with folks that had marched from Washington, DC, where we had filed an indictment of the US government for violating human rights because of welfare reform, because of NAFTA, because of, of you know, structural adjustment policies, and, and then found ourselves getting to think about the strategy at Union. And, and it was Union faculty and, and students and staff that, that welcomed us and, and said, this, this conversation has to continue. And so when I realized that my call to do justice and, and love kindness was actually a religious one. The, the, the only place I could go was Union and, and Union made it possible because I got a, an awesome scholarship in the name of, of William Sloan Coffin and, and he got to actually help um, start the poverty initiative with us. And, and I know if he had still been alive, he would have been very supportive of the Kairos Center um, of, of this Kairos time because he and I would talk about Kairos and 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 the the need for for you know religious leadership and moral leadership in in times such as these and so you know a lot of my upbringing you know shaped and put me on this path but then it was actually meeting poor and homeless families in Philadelphia in Michigan in California who were who were coming together and organizing, who, who then kind of said to me, okay, well, what is the religious response to, uh, to, to this? You know, why do we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? And, and what are you and what are other people of faith going to do about it? Yeah, yeah. I love that. Worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore, oppress, destroy That's the homeless right. man on Monday. Um, you know, I, I always say, I get in um, arguments about, you know, LGBTQ issues and um, the Bible. And he said, you know, it's just like, the Bible says absolutely nothing about that, but it says something on every single page about poverty. And, the, and you don't see the churches having huge, splits over poverty they're not even paying attention to it they're paying attention to the thing that doesn't that's not even there so um and the poverty initiative has been so crucial in that but uh, so i know we're, we're getting towards the time of questions but i, I just want to ask you this one so kairos you know it's a time of crisis it's it means crisis and change and our nation has been in crisis since its beginning uh, uh, it's a history of violence in crisis. Um, but never in my lifetime, um, as short as it's been, have I experienced our nation being in the level of intersecting multiple um, life or death crisis that it is in right now. Um, I mean, we, we are teetering on the edge of collapse. For many, it has already collapsed. Um, so what does it mean to be Kairos right now? That's a really important question, right? I mean, it's, it, this, this is a time of crisis. You know, there are so many emergencies happening at the same time. Um, you know, the, the level of, uh, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure folks have seen this, but 
you know, in June, 10% of folks in the United States said that they were um, suicidal. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, the, the kind of housing crisis that we're, we're starting to see in terms of tens of millions of people facing eviction, um, it, it's unprecedented. Um, the, the um, you know, this, this rise in white supremacist violence, um, you know, it's, I mean, and I, I, I'm not one to say that I, I don't, I mean, we know that there have been other moments in history where um, real, you know, pain, real suffering um, uh, are, are the, the whole reality. And, and if we look at our biblical traditions, we know that that's a long history, right? You know, and, and, but what it means is that people, you know, this is a moment when, uh, you know, when, when something new is possible. I mean, that basically what plagues and pandemics reveal um, throughout, you know, history and our biblical tradition is foundations of injustice. And when those foundations are revealed, when you kind of pull the you know, you pull the veil off, then then there's some potential for for kind of coming together and and doing something and building something different. So, for instance, the Poor People's Campaign released a uh, study last month that shows that it's really poor and low-income people who hold the key hold the key to transforming the entire political calculus of this nation, right? That actually, if we look at the 2016 election, that 15 of the states that the electoral votes went for, for the person that we have in presidency right now, um, if just a very small percentage of poor and low income people who were eligible to vote, but didn't vote and didn't vote because of voter suppression, didn't vote because of, um, uh, you know, transportation and childcare issues, but also didn't vote because nobody was talking about the issues that impact people. Um, but that those folks hold the ability, they far exceed the margin of, a, of victory um, in those 15 states, less than 20%. In some cases, Michigan, 1%. In Pennsylvania, 4 to 6%. You know, I mean, that th that that change is possible. And, and what we've also put out is, that if you do the math, if you if you look at that actually inequality, actually poverty, actually racism, actually de, you know killing our environment is costing our society more than the solutions to actually end and 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 abolish yes. those things. And so, so Kairos in this moment means that we it doesn't have to be this way, and. And, and we've now exposed that. And so now how do we build the power, shift the narrative to be able to have the political will to, to change all of that? And, and that's, you know, again, what our Bible traditions show us over and over again is that, is that, you, is that you build up that power and then those transformations are possible. That restructuring of society, that radical, you know, bold visionary change um, it comes to be a reality, not just a, a wish list. Wow. I feel better than I did when I woke up this morning just listening to you. Thank you. Yeah. I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that. And I'm sure everyone who's joined us needs to hear that too. So, Reed, it's time for our questions, isn't it? Exactly. And they're coming in. So thank you all. Please keep them coming. We're going to try to get um, get to all of them. Um, Liz, Serene, thank you both so very much. This is a conversation that we've wanted to have for a long time. I hope this is only part one of what will be a another conversation and another follow-up to this conversation. It was just that rich, so thank you both. Um, so David Bennett of Williamsburg, Virginia asked, um, how do you actually mobilize uh, this mass movement? What roadmap or strategy are those? Are these prophetic leaders following to bring the needed change? So can you talk a little bit about the roadmap and strategy, if you will? Yeah, so the goals that we have, you know, both in the Cairo Center and in the Poor People's Campaign um, are, are, are they're, they're really big, but, they're, but there's only a couple of them, right? Um, we basically say that 
to, to be able to, 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 to bring about systemic change, um, to build a mass movement, that we need to shift the narrative. We have to get our nation, our world talking about the issues, seeing the solutions, talking about the solutions, putting some of them into action, and then also build power, build power you know, what we're proposing is amongst the 140 million and growing um, poor and low income people, folks that are impacted by all of these injustices, these interlocking injustices and, and power that in the words of Dr. King will make the power structures say yes, even if they're desirous of saying no, right? Um, and so, so to, to shift the narrative and to build power, you know, it, it's, it's, it's all kinds of mobilizing and organizing tactics. Right now in this election season, we are engaged in something that we call, we must do more. We're not waiting for anybody to come save us. We're not saying that it's up to the politicians to, to do everything right. It's that we must do more. And more stands for mobilizing, organizing, registering, and educating people for a movement that votes. And, and again, it's not just about registering people to vote. It's not just about mobilizing people to vote. It's about bringing people into a movement. And, and you do that by meeting people's immediate needs, um, you do that by engaging in deep political education. You do that by, you know, making sure that folks have ways of protesting the injustice around them um, in this pandemic, both in social distance and online kinds of ways, as well as, you know, again, uh, safely in, in person um, and, and kind of disrupting the 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 forces of which are disrupting our society so much, you know, in a nonviolent uh, proactive way. And then you, you also don't just, you know, kind of curse the darkness. You don't just mm -hmm. point out what's wrong, but you, you, you bring forward the kinds of solutions, you know, like we have put together a very bold visionary policy platform. Um, and then we've presented that, you know, to uh, the Senate, to the House Budget Committee, to different hearings and caucuses. Um, you know, that these are the, these are the solutions, you know, and, and that they're here at hand and they connect, you know, racist voter suppression with police brutality, with the militarization of our communities, with LGBTQ rights, with healthcare for all, with, and that you can't solve one of those problems without actually coming forward and, and, and really proposing a way to solve them all. And so, you know, this is a, this is a project of, of doing deep political um, organizing, but it's also one that has biblical and theological foundations to it, right? It's one that, that the kinds of, of courses that student Union Theological Seminary students are taking and, and that Union Theological Seminary professors are teaching are the, the, uh, is the very kind of material that folks need to have the tools that they need in their toolbox to be able to be out in the world making a difference right now. And, and so, you know, that's, you know, it's, it, it's a lot, um, but it's exactly what people are doing and, and, and being equipped to do right now. Right, right. I think that brings us right to our next question. So Seibel asks, and please forgive me if I mispronounced your first name, I apologize. Um, what creative ways or language do you use to help social justice activists who are new to faith or relatively unchurched to join you in this deeply spiritual grounded work? In other words, how do you make the case for being called by God into this work? And if you'll keep that answer, because we have about two more questions we'll love to get to. So, yeah. You kind of know that both Serena and myself have like multiple books on that. So we shouldn't, <laughs> we shouldn't go into all of the said, yes, we've exactly. ever made. All right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, so again, trying to be brief. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you hold up a sacred text like the Bible, and if you cut out all the places where justice and poverty and freedom for the oppressed are, uh, there's more than 2000, maybe 2,500 passages, right? Mm -hmm. So literally the Bible falls apart. Um, mm -hmm. So there's those specific texts that we could look to and, and could be inspired by. Um, and, and then there's the, the really heretical way 
that biblical and, theolo biblical and theological kind of ideas are, are used, and, and Serene was talking about this before, to really hold up injustice um, and to thwart the, the, the work of doing justice. And so, so I'm not interested in convincing people not of faith to, mm -hmm. to you know, the, the kind of evangelizing, the evangelos, you know, of the Bible is about bringing good news to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. And what's good news? I mean, good news, the gospel is, you know, uh, food. It's healthcare, it's living wages, it's ending mass incarceration, right? I mean, it's 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 not some spiritualized something over there. It's it's you know, on earth as it is in heaven, right? I mean, our texts are very clear about this. Um, and so I, I'm not interested in in churching the unchurched, um, but I am very interested in the fact that there a week does not go by in my life um, where somebody doesn't try to use the Bible to to, to basically justify an action in the face of grave injustice mm -hmm. and to say that the only moral issues of our day are who marries who, who has sex with who, that Jesus was a card carrying member of the NRA, that, that property rights are sacrosanct, right? When, what, when, as Serene said, our religious traditions, our sacred texts say that how you honor and worship God is what you do with your immigrant neighbor not just people that you like and agree with, it's your immigrant labor, that, that how you, you know, that, that woe to you who, who legislate evil, right? Not woe to you about like that, you know, you, you weren't the nicest to your kid today, not, not like, and you got frustrated with homeschooling, woe to you who legislate evil, who rob the poor of their rights. Like this is what our sacred texts say. And so to me, part of this is it like, and we're talking about people of all kinds of faith and not of faith, but who see that the arc of the universe bends towards justice as, as Dr. King and so many others have kind of pointed out. Amen. Right. Serene, do you mind taking a stab at the same question? Because as Liz said, you both have numerous books on this. And I, we would be remiss if we did not hear your voice on the same question. I mean, I just would say that a big ditto to what Liz said so beautifully. But, you know, the, the point in movements and even at Union, which is now so multi-faith and so many students not of faith traditions, you know, the point is not um, as we work for social change to convert people to you know, this tradition or that, but the uniting power is the power of the, of the truth of social justice and the liberation of people. And that's, that's the good news. And that's the part that matters. So we thank you both. Thank you. We have, we have two more questions. I'm going to ask both of them at the same time, because we have two minutes and I think we can get to both. I would love to have um, both of you have one final word to say. And just to our audience, thank you, thank you, thank you. We so appreciate you and value you. Um, there will be more knowledge and nourishments to come. We hope to have a part two to this one. Um, so please join us. We look forward to having you. So John M asked, um, the idea of putting ourselves in the condition of the other is central to Christianity and to our civic discourse. What do you think uh, is it, what do you think it is that impedes action in the sphere of both church and state along these lines? And Nikia asked, what happened to, to Willie Baptist, the former scholar in residence with the Poverty Initiative? Is he still a partner in this work? So you could probably start with, with Nikia's question first because it may be quicker to answer and then love to hear what you both have to say about John's question. We have one minute. Yeah. yeah, so in terms of Willie Baptist, he still is the Poverty Scholar in Residence for the Cairo Center and he coordinates our Poverty Scholarship and Leadership Development Program um, and uh, is, is playing a, a very significant role, particularly kind of training and, 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 and educating um, uh, many of the kind of uh, forgotten like real heroes and heroines of our nation, um, folks that are living in homeless encampments, but who are uh, organizing, you know, for this Poor People's Campaign and, and these Medicaid marches and, and these kinds of, of things and beyond. And so um, I will pass on um, greetings uh, to, to him, but he's, he's very around. I mean, no one's in the union, union offices these days, but, but he is, he's, he's very involved in the work still. So. 
Willie Baptist is still Willie Baptist. <laughs> it is good work, yes. Right. Um, if, the last, if that question was about, you know, what are the obstacles? Um, there's so, I mean, the obstacles are many, they're multitude, they're legion. Um, but I think um, the most significant is the, um, the intensification of, of gross levels of capital in very small um, collections of people and interest. Um, when you are trying to have a functioning democracy where people are treated equally and you have an economic system that has no notion of democracy in it, no capacity for democracy in it, you're inevitably gonna end up in the disaster that we're in right now. And so there's no way we can move forward without in major ways dismantling that, the whole structure of the, uh, the uh, post-capitalist, still market-driven, um, concentrated wealth system that we have now. Thank you both. Uh, Nakia Robert has an amazing question. We're out of ta time, but I would love to follow up with our guests who are on here today. And we're gonna follow up with Nakia's question. So I'll ask that offline of both of you. Um, she has a part two to her question um, in addition to asking about Willie. Um, so thank you both. Liz, do you wanna have the final word? So um, there's a lie that goes on in this country and in this world that uh, there isn't enough. Mm -hmm. That if God wanted to end injustice, God would do so. And that it's the fault of those who are exploited and oppressed and excluded um, for every problem, not just their own poverty and, and um, oppression. And, and, and that is a heretical lie. It's, it's not true um, empirically. You know, we have uh, five abandoned houses for every homeless person. We have, we throw away more food than feeds, not just this country, but the whole world over. Um, but it's also a lie that, that is, it gets at the idolatry that Moses and the Mosaic law and, and the prophets and everybody kind of uh, puts out. And so to me, one of the things that we're called to do in this time is to, is to defeat this lie of scarcity and that we need to do so through the kinds of classes that unions teaching and the kinds of actions that people are taking in our streets and our communities um, and say that no, life is abundant and beautiful and it does not have to be this way, but it will be this way as long as we're divided and pitted against each other and we, are, are, and we, and we swallow this lie. Um, mm -hmm that this is as good as it gets. Um, and so may this moment, um, this pandemic, this scourge of racist violence, these wildfires, may this be a moment where we can say, normal never again. Um, we, we can do better and we're gonna come together and do that. Um, and, and with union helping to lead the way. So thanks again to, to you all, but um, let's, let's keep this work alive. Exactly, exactly. And we start by saying her name, Brianna Taylor. So we start the way we, we, we end the way we started um, with um, just good thoughts for Brianna Taylor's family and all those affected by racism. Thank you both. Bye, everyone. Bye bye.